put all uh, other things aside. And I hope that this is not true for you personally, but I'm sure that most of us have experienced at some point in our lives having done something that we are absolutely sure that God will not forgive us of. Perhaps you've uh, made some bad decision that has then led you down on a path of further bad decisions and continued with some bad choices until you find yourself in a truly dark and scary place. I hope that that hasn't happened to you, but I'm sure if, uh, if we really think about ourselves and think about the times that we've, uh, we've sinned against the Lord, that we may have been in a place like that before. The truth is that all of us have sinned and fall short of the standards of God. All of us have done things that we regret. All of us have said things that have hurt others, and we have violated God's laws. We all fall short of God's standards, and we all need to be forgiven. That is really the universal state of all people. No one is exempt from this. Sometimes, however, I feel that uh, we cannot face God because our guilt is all too much and our sin is all too great. Well, let me say that the Bible teaches that the God that we know is the God of compassion. He is the God of grace. And no sin is too great for God to forgive and no guilt is too much for God to cleanse. Today is Shabbat Shuvah in Jewish tradition. It's the Sabbath of repentance, which is the Sabbath that falls between Rosh Hashanah, or the uh, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. These ten days between the two festivals are known as the ten days of repentance. And also, this Shabbat is the Shabbat of repentance. And so today we take, we're going to take a look at a psalm that King David wrote after he had been confronted by the prophet Nathan for the sin that he had committed. And he didn't just commit one sin. No, David broke, about, uh, broke uh, probably about ten of the Ten Commandments with just one, one act uh, that he, he got himself into, one bad choice that led to other bad choices and bad decisions. And why and how would God ever forgive him? Let's read Psalm 51. And uh, we're going to read the entire psalm and then have a look at it piece by piece. Psalm 51, to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud for your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, 
a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good in Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. And so what a wonderful psalm. Certainly a well-known psalm in uh, Jewish liturgy as well as, of course, in the Christian experience as well. Very well-known and popular psalm. So what was the sin that David had committed? Well, the full story of that sin can be found in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and the beginning of the chapter verse 2 all the way through to chapter 12 verse 15. Let's read how David's sin escalated from a moment of lust in David's heart to full-blown covetousness, murder, and deceit. Let me read to you from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 to 5. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Well, you can see it's as though David was a little bit bored, perhaps. His army was off vanquishing enemies, but he was back in Jerusalem, and it seems like he had not much to do. He had just had an afternoon nap. He steps outside onto the roof of his palace, and he sees a beautiful woman bathing. In a moment of weakness, he doesn't look away, but rather he begins to lust after her. And he allowed that lust to grow within him like a fire, compelling him to find out more about this woman. And despite her being married to Uriah the Hittite, he calls for her and he sleeps with her. He then exacerbated his sin by having Uriah the Hittite effectively murdered in battle so that he can take Bathsheba as his wife, hiding his adultery and making it look like the baby was the premature byproduct of their marriage. In this one act, David broke several of the Ten Commandments. He broke the Tenth Commandment. He coveted his neighbor's wife. He broke the seventh commandment. He committed adultery. He broke the sixth commandment. He murdered someone. And he broke the eighth commandment. He effectively stole somebody else's wife. He may well have broken all the commandments because he certainly was not loving the Lord his God with all of his heart and loving his neighbor as himself. It's also apparent in the story that even though Uriah was not an Israelite, but a Hittite, he was a better man than King David himself. Nathan the prophet confronted David for his sin by telling him a very clever parable. He told him a parable of a man who had a lamb that he loved and cared for so much. He loved this lamb as his very own daughter. Yet a rich man took this lamb away from him and slaughtered it and prepared it to serve to a visitor because the rich man didn't want to take a lamb from his own flock. David was outraged at this injustice of the rich man and he pronounced judgment upon him and he said, this man deserves to die. Nathan then confronted David with these words which which must have struck to the heart of David and he said, you are the man. Wow, that must have been totally confronting and I'm sure fear would have come upon David's heart. 
When David heard these words, guilt and shame must have totally overwhelmed him at that moment because David truly did love the Lord. And he didn't try to make excuses for his sin and he actually admits, I have sinned against the Lord in 2 Samuel 12, 13. It must have been after this that David went over to a quiet place and wrote this psalm, a psalm of confession and repentance with a broken and a contrite heart. This psalm is one of the seven penitential psalms in the book of Psalms. And this psalm really stands out for us as a paradigm of prayers for forgiveness of sins and reminds us, uh, as one commentator puts it, that the vilest offender against God, uh, uh, sorry, the vilest offender among God's people can appeal to God for forgiveness, for moral restoration, and for the resumption of a joyful life of fellowship and service if he comes with a broken spirit and bases his appeal on God's compassion and grace. And so let's look at the psalm in a little bit more detail. There are three distinct, distinct parts of the psalm. First of all, we see that David admits his sin in verses 1 to 5. David honors God in verses 4b to 6. And then David pleads for mercy in verses 1 and 2 and also in verses 7 to 12. So let's read, first of all, 1 to 5, where David admits his sin. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know that my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So first of all, David admits the seriousness of his sin, and he uses four words for sin that uh, really illustrates the seriousness of his sin. First of all, he uses the word pesha, or transgressions. And this refers to rebellion, or deliberately crossing over a boundary. He also uses the word avon, iniquity, suggesting uh, a perverseness or twistedness. There's also the word chatat, which means sin, and it means falling short of God's standard or missing the target that God has set. And then also the word ra, evil, simply referring to the ugly, repulsive nature of sin against God. So David, first of all, admits the seriousness of his sin. Then secondly, he acknowledges the essence of his sin. Basically, sin is rebellion against God, thumbing our noses at God, our creator. Sin is, in fact, humanity wishing that God and his rules did not exist. David acknowledges that this is ultimately against God, that he has actually sinned. And yes, of course, David did sin against, against Bathsheba, and certainly against Uriah, Uriah. And he also, of course, sinned against the entire nation of Israel because he was the king of Israel. But he had sinned primarily against God because it's God who defines proper behavior towards others. And thirdly, David also acknowledges the origin of his sin, the very root of sin, that is human nature. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now I believe, contrary to what Judaism teaches, that all human beings are tainted by the sin of Adam and Eve. The sin principle pervades this whole world. We all sin because we are actually all born sinners as a, a result of the fall of humanity, the fall of Adam and Eve. Now this doesn't excuse us from our sin, but it does remind us that we all need a savior. We all are sinners. 
Theologians call this condition of the human race total depravity. If we're going to truly repent of our sins, we need to agree with God that we are indeed sinners, that we have indeed sinned. No excuses, no rationalizations will do. We simply have to confess our sin before the Lord. And so we also see how David honors God in verses 4b to 6. He says, So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. In acknowledging his sin, David was agreeing with God that his sin was indeed sin. Prior to this, he had actually hidden his sin, and he was not forthcoming with a confession. Now, however, he agrees with God, and he condemns his own sin together with God. David also recognizes that God's standard of righteous behavior is right, and that God requires us to conform to his laws, not only in outward behavior, but also in the inner intention of the heart. He says, you delight in truth, in the inward being, in the secret heart. And that is also, of course, in line with the teachings of Yeshua the Messiah, who taught us that it was not just uh, enough to follow the outward appearance of, uh, of obedience to the Torah, but we had to have the right inner intention of the heart. And Yeshua pointed out that you can uh, you commit adultery by even lusting after someone without even having done the actual act. But because it's in your heart, you've already committed the sin. Yeshua was actually making Torah observance more difficult because you had to follow the Messiah and fo follow God with the true intention of your heart, which is the true intent of Torah in the first place. But then, of course, we know as New Covenant believers, He gives us His Ruach, His Spirit, to help us to keep that law. But certainly here, David reminds us that God wants truth in our innermost being, not just outward observance, but in our innermost being, in the secret heart. Then David simply pleads for mercy. In verses 1 and 2 and 7 to 12, let me read, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. And verses 7 to 12, Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my transgressions, or my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take, me not, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. As I said in the beginning, how could David have the chutzpah, the gumption, to come to God for forgiveness? He could, how could he have such a terrible audacity in thinking that God would forgive him? How could he even face God even, even after he had offended God so deeply? The answer is that David must have known something about the character of God, the nature of God. And he says that God is the God of chesed, steadfast love, and rachamim, abundant mercies. He based his plea to God on God's very own character. David was a man who elsewhere is described as a man who is after God's own heart. And David knew that God even though he had sinned greatly against him, he knew that God would receive him as a penitent sinner back into fellowship with him. And so when we have sinned, that's what we need to do as well. We come to God appealing on his own nature. God is gracious and forgiving, yet we do need to come to him with a repentant heart. As Devarim Rabbah, a midrash on Deuteronomy, explains... Rabbi Hananiah ba Papa asked Rabbi Samuel ba Nachman, what is the meaning of this verse? 
As for me, I will offer my prayer unto you in an acceptable time. He replied, The gates of prayer are sometimes open and sometimes closed, but the gates of repentance is always open. The gates of repentance are always open, and David based his plea upon the character of God. However, David's plea for forgiveness was not just a, a quick and meaningless prayer, O oh Lord, forgive me of my sins, but rather it was a truly repentant prayer, and it was also thoroughly earnest. He asked God to blot out his transgressions, to cleanse him of unrighteousness, to wash him, and God would make him whiter than snow. Reminds me of what the prophet Isaiah also said on behalf of God. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. What a good verse for us at this time of the year. The Lord calls us to reason with him. And we can't stand before holy God. We're all sinners. The only way that we can approach a holy God is confess our sins. And he will wash us whiter than snow. God is able to wipe our slate clean. He's able to give us a fresh start. When we come to him for forgiveness, and if we really do have a truly repentant heart, and, and we truly are trusting the atonement that comes from Yeshua the Messiah, then God cleanses us from all sin and makes us as white as snow. Do you know that when there is sin in our lives, it robs us of joy and it destroys our fellowship or our relationship with God. God hides his face from us when we sin. And that's why David longed for God to lift his face upon him once again and give him joy. When David hid his sin and he hadn't confessed it, it was as if his bones were wasting away within him. But with confession of sin before the Lord, it's like a health coming back to your bones. It's like a heavy load that is being lifted up. It's like a switch uh, that is switched on in a dark room and light comes into that room immediately. That's what it feels like when you have your sins forgiven. I wonder if you still remember that first moment coming to faith in Yeshua the Messiah, asking God to forgive you for your sins and having that experience of knowledge of that sin being washed away through faith in the Messiah. I still remember that first moment when I first received Yeshua as my Lord and Savior, and many times that I've sinned again, coming to him in repentance, knowing that there is forgiveness through Yeshua the Messiah, but we need to come to him with a repentant and contrite heart. I love these verses. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. What a wonderful prayer. Finally, in verses 13 and 17, we see two things that David was absolutely confident about. That God would use his experience to influence others. We read in verse 13, Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. And also, secondly, that God would not fail to hear his plea. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart, a broken spirit, a contrite heart of God you will not despise. Now the rabbis of Yavne incorrectly used this verse as a rationale for their belief that in the wake of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, that the sacrifices of God are now a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And that one can be forgiven for your sin through repentance, prayer, and good deeds. That's what Judaism still continues to teach today. That the sacrifices of God are no longer animal sacrifices, blood sacrifices, but a broken and contrite heart. And that you can be forgiven for your sins through uh, repentance, through shiva, through uh, prayer, and uh, through tzedakah, uh, through uh, good deeds. While it's true, that God does require a repentant heart, and he does require that we come to him recognizing our brokenness, being sorry for our sins, we still do actually need a guilt offering for our sin. God still requires 
a righteous sacrifice. And that sacrifice was provided for all of us through Yeshua HaMashiach, through Yeshua the Messiah on the cross. The Messiah was the guilt offering for our sin. The writer of the book of Hebrews picks us up when he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies. Just like David had boldness because he knew the character of God, we too, through faith in the Messiah, we have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Yeshua. He inaugurated a new and living way for us through the curtain, that is, his flesh. We also have a Kohen Gadol, that's a great high priest, over God's household. So let us draw near with a true, a true heart in full assurance of faith, with hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and body washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the unwavering confession of hope for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one, and up, stir one another up to love and good deeds. And do not neglect our own meetings, as it is the habit of some, of some, but encourage one another all the more so as you see the day approaching. What wonderful encouragement for us. Let us take uh, this to heart this time of the year as we come to the Lord in repentance, knowing that if God can forgive David of those sins that he committed, he can forgive us as well. Whatever the sin that you've done, whatever you've you feel that is a barrier between you and the Lord, just confess it before him with a broken and contrite heart, believing in Yeshua the Messiah's sacrifice on your behalf, and you can be assured of forgiveness of sin. And so we can draw near to the Lord. We can have a bold uh, confidence to come close to him at this time through the curtain and into the Holy of Holies, as we had in uh, one of our earlier songs today. And as we come up to Yom Kippur next week on Wednesday night as we enter into the Day of Atonement. Let's enter in with confession of sin, with a repentant heart, with a contrite heart. But let us also know that Yeshua the Messiah has paid the penalty for us and, and so it's with confidence and boldness we can enter in. Let us pray. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father and our King, thank you that you have made a way for us that we can come into the presence of our Father in heaven. We can come with boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies because of the blood of Yeshua, our Messiah. We thank you, Lord, that you are our great high priest and that you have mediated a way for us. And so, Lord, we are going to stand firm, unwavering on the confession of hope because you who, are pro you who have promised is faithful. You are faithful, O Lord, and we trust in your good word. We trust in the Messiah and we trust in your Ruach HaKodesh, to encourage us in these days. For this we pray, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.